stand, take your song book, and turn to song number 196. And Brother Bob is coming to lead us in that song. We'll begin singing. On, we ask you to sing on stanza number two. <clears throat> I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray. Through his loving arms around me, drew me back into his way. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory. I was bruised, but Jesus healed me. First was high for many a fall. Sin is gone and tears possessed me, but he freed me from them all. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with this ancient glory Gathered by the crystal sea Days of darkness still come o'er me Sorrows past I often tread But the Savior still is with me By his hand I'm safely led Yes, I'll see story of the Christ who died for me, singing with the saints in glory, gathered by the crystal sea. He will keep me till the river holds its waters at my feet, then he'll bear me safely over where the loved ones I shall meet. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. Please remain standing for morning prayer. <laughs> Well, amen. It's good to see you here this morning. God bless you for being here. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord. Excited about what the Lord has for us in this hour. And I want you to pray that God would bless in every part, in the singing, the giving, the preaching. It all would bring honor and glory to the name of Jesus Christ. That's what we desire to do. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for those who have gathered here this day. And thank you for the privilege that we have together here. Uh, Lord, thank you for bringing us here safely this day. Uh, Lord, we just take it for granted just to get in a vehicle and move from place to place. Uh, but we thank you that you uh, watched over us, you protected us, and brought us here. And Lord, we've assembled here today to meet with thee. Uh, Lord, not just out of rote duty, but because we love you and we desire to hear from heaven today. And Lord, I pray as we enter into this worship hour that you would get honor and glory in everything that's said and done. Uh, Lord, I pray as we have opportunity again as a congregation in just a few moments to lift our voices and sing unto you. May we do as we just sang in this song. And may we sing of the wondrous story of how you came for us and shed your life's blood. Lord, I pray that you'd bless this choir as they sing. Be with uh, Brother Smith as he leads it. Lord, I pray that you would guide and direct and help us to uh, lift up the name of Jesus and prepare our hearts, uh, Lord, for... Uh, the message that is to come in just a little bit. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to give and give generously out of a heart of love for you. And then help us to receive your word. Lord, I pray you'd help this preacher as I preach it. Lord, give me a clarity of mind and of thought and of heart. Uh, you know my heart to be a clean vessel and be used of you. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd speak to hearts that are here. If there's any that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Savior whether they be in this room, whether they be in other parts of the building with uh, meetings that are going on for our children, whatever the case may be, 
Lord, I pray that today would be the day they would trust you and know for sure that heaven's their home. And for every one of us uh, here in this room and in, throughout the building that uh, would say that we are a child of the King, that we know Jesus Christ as Savior, uh, Lord, may you speak to our hearts. Uh, may we be ready to hear and then respond in obedience to what you speak to us about. Guide and direct, we pray, in everything that's said and done. We surrender it all over to Thee. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. your hymnals once again please and turn to hymn number 228 I love to tell the story and would you stand please together let us sing all four verses of hymn number 228 <clears throat> I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and His glory, of Jesus and His love. I love to tell the story, because I know tis true, it satisfies my longing 
as nothing else can do. I'd love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, more wonderful it seems than all the golden fancies of all the golden dreams. I love to tell the story, it did so much for me. And that is just the reason I tell it now to thee. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, tis pleasant to repeat. What seems each time I tell it, more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story, for some have never heard. The message of salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best. Seem hungering and thirsty to hear it like the rest. And when it seems of glory, I sing the new, new song. Will be the old, old story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Thank you, and please be seated. Well, amen. Very good. Our men are coming this way. If you're visiting with us today, God bless you for being here. And these men want to put a packet of information in your hand. If you'll raise your hand as they make their way back uh, to you there, and uh, they'll put that in your hand. There's a card on the inside. If you'd fill it out, leave it with us in the offering plate. We'll have a record of your visit. And God bless you for being here today at Calvary Independent Baptist Church. If you have a bulletin, if you take it out and look at it with me, just a few announcements I want to make to you here this morning and concerning some things that are upcoming here. The Senior Saints trip will be this coming Friday over to the York Agriculture Museum and then also over to see the Tannenberg Organ and leaving at 9 a.m. Friday and returning at 4.30. The cost for the uh, museum is $6, and then lunch will be at the Old Country Buffet. So if you haven't signed up for that, let me encourage you to do so. In uh, just a few weeks, uh, we'll be having our Back to School Sunday, and uh, that will be on the 25th, and we need some help. We have a big water war that day after the service, and we always need help filling up water balloons, so if you can help us with that, That'll be Saturday the 24th, and if you can help us, if you'd see Brother Kevin Kreider about that, and we normally fill up several hundred of those, and you think, well, that's a lot, and they're probably gone in about five minutes, 
And uh, so maybe not even that long. And uh, so if you could help us with that. It takes a lo longer time to fill it up than it does to pop them. Let's put it that way. And if you could help us with that, that'd be a great blessing. Our uh, Solanco School of the Bible, this will be our third semester, but this has been designed, as we said when we started, it's been designed, even if you didn't, weren't involved in it all last year, you can still dive right in uh, this year, and you won't be in the middle of any classes. You'll be right at the, uh, right at the beginning of it, and that'll be great. Uh, three classes will be offered, uh, the Christian Home, Teaching the Bible, and a survey of the New Testament, Part 1, and that'll begin on Monday, September the 9th. That's $25 per class if you just take one. Uh, if you take all three, it's $60. So if you'd like to be a part of that, that'd be great. Remember, if you take all the semesters, there's four semesters, that'd be 12 classes. Uh, it'd take two years to do that. You do that, and uh, you can get a Bible certificate in March in the graduation uh, ceremonies at the Crown College down in Powell, Tennessee, and uh, get that certificate. It'll say Solanco School of the Bible on it. And uh, it'd be a, I think it'd be a help and encouragement to you. Let me encourage you to, to plan to be a part of it. There's a sign-up sheet out there, and we really need to know who's going to be doing that by the 28th. So you have a couple weeks here to figure all that out. We need to order it by then. So if you can help us with that. Some upcoming events. Next Sunday evening, uh, Brother Bill Hardecker, he's missionary to the Philippines. He'll be with us in the evening service. He's from uh, over at Mount Zion Baptist Church, being sent out of there over in Brogue. So let me encourage you to be here uh, to hear him on next Sunday evening. Board members will have our meeting, 415, next Sunday afternoon. <clears throat> the 25th is our monthly fellowship. We'll celebrate birthdays and anniversaries. And then on the 27th, our ministry at the Presbyterian Retirement Community. That's Tuesday evening. And uh, Sunday school picnic on September the 8th. We mentioned the School of the Bible on the 9th. And then off in October is the ladies' conference, but you ladies probably want to plan for that now. And uh, that's a Friday, Saturday, and part of the day on Sunday, and be coming back in the afternoon uh, on Sunday. Uh, that's October the 18th through the 20th. Birthday and anniversary cards for the missionaries for September are out in the lobby to be signed. If you haven't signed those, let me encourage you to do so. On the back, some prayer requests are listed here, and I trust you remember these folks in prayer and uh, many people listed here on this, and I trust that you'll keep them before you, before the Lord. Now, let me ask you to include <clears throat> the Bryson family uh, on that list, the Bryson family. And uh, Essence comes with Brother Leon and Marty. The church been coming for, for several years now uh, to our church here. Essence mother passed away this past Monday, and uh, that funeral will be tomorrow. Uh, up in Lancaster. So if you pray for the Bryson family, Roslyn, Essence, Ebony, and Idris, there's a card out on the Welcome Center for them. They just want to put your name on it. You don't even have to worry about addressing it or mailing it. If you'd like to do that, we have an address out there as well. You can send them your own card. But there's a card right on the Welcome Center. When you go out this morning, why don't you just sign your name, say, I'm praying for you. And uh, that'd be a great encouragement, I believe, uh, to the family at this time. Show of the week, Adelaide Kelly, and her address is given for you there. If you can send her a note, I know that'd be an encouragement to her this week. Mr. of the week are the chaplains, been faithfully serving the Lord uh, for longer than this preacher's been alive. Uh, they've been on the mission field, and uh, thank God for it in the Congo, and then uh, now in Suriname for many years, and be praying for the ministry there that uh, God would continue to bless and use them in a great way. Good letter uh, in the Sunday School Hour. Service opportunities throughout the week there. Let me remind you, uh, choir, 5.30 tonight, and 6.15, we meet and pray together. 6.30 is the service. Life on Calvary, a sacrifice for you. If you'll receive my Jesus, then you will love him too. Amen? Amen? Isn't that the case? If you received him, you can say that's true, right? No doubt about it. Let's stand and we'll sing it together. Chorus number 20. I wish you knew my Jesus. <clears throat> I 
I wish you knew my Jesus and loved him as I do. For if you knew my Jesus, then you would love him too. He gave his life at Calvary, a sacrifice for you. If you'll receive my Jesus, then you will love him too. Now, Wendy's going to play that through. When you sing that song, and you think about the truth of that song, let it show on your face. Let it show on your face. And, uh, you know, go ahead and smile this morning. It takes less muscles to smile than it does to frown. You know, so smile. It'll help you. It'll help your disposition. Read someone there next to you. <laughs> hey, well, John, good to see you. very good as you make your way back let's sing that through one more time I wish you knew my Jesus I wish you knew my Jesus and loved him as I do for if you knew my Jesus then you would love him too he gave his life at Calvary the sacrifice for you if you'll receive my Jesus then you will love him too very good that was so much better <laughs> praise the Lord that's great now many of you didn't have a frown on your face you just had a blank look on your face Ah, but it's good to see you smiling. Praise the Lord for that. Remain standing, gentlemen, if you'll come, we'll be ready to receive our offering. I have a note here. It says, thank you for the prayers, cards, phone calls, and visits while my stay in the hospital and since coming home. And that's from Brother Carl Absher. It's good to see him here and back in the service today with us. And praise the Lord for that. I got a little uh, email from Brother Hassler. And I was telling the guys yesterday at prayer breakfast, he made it back. Everything was smooth sailing. Matter of fact, he was early. Uh, into Rio and uh, the uh, taxi was there he went through customs with no problem he arrived back in the uh, at the church with a uh, hot meal and everything just went great went back home and everything turned on in the house uh, so everything was working beautifully and uh, praise the Lord for that so uh, keep praying for his his housing in, in uh, the new city in Campinas that that would work out just as smoothly as well Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing here. Brother Chuck Kirk, would you lead us in prayer, please? Father God, how we thank you, Lord, for your love for us and, Lord, for this place where we come and worship you. Now, Lord, as we get back to you, we ask, Lord, that you would take these monies and use it to further your work here in this world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.
take your hymnals once again, please, and turn to hymn number 12, Blessed Redeemer. And would you stand, please, together? Let us sing all three verses of hymn number 12. Up Calvary's mountain, one dreadful morn, walk Christ my Savior, weary and warm, facing for sinners, death on the cross, that he might save them from endless loss. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, Seems now I see him on Calvary's tree. Wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading. Blind and unheeding, dying for me. Father, forgive them, thus did he pray. Even while his life blood flows fast away, praying for sinners while in such woe, no one but Jesus ever loved so. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, sees now I see him on Calvary's tree. Wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying for me. Oh, how I love him, Savior and friend. How can my praises ever find him? Through years unnumbered, on heaven's shore, my tongue shall praise him forevermore. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see him on Calvary's tree. Wounded and bleeding, for sinners plead. Thank you, and please be seated. Well, amen. Well, that's a great song, and it stirs my heart to think about that. And uh, that last verse, really, you know, is a, it's a prayer, a consecration, testimony. Oh, how I love him, Savior and friend. How can my praises ever find in? You ever stop and just listen to the words? Sometimes, you know... Uh, I've been singing songs like this, and some of you are probably the same way. You've been singing them all year, from the time I was small enough to remember many of these songs. Uh, I don't know that I'm, I'm to the point. I think my father-in-law, I think you could call a number and he'd just sing it, you know. And I don't think I'm there yet. <laughs> maybe I will be, but some of them maybe. Uh, but if we're not careful, you know what? It just becomes a routine thing. Oh, yeah, well, we're singing Blessed Assurance again, you know. Well, stop. Stop and listen to the words of these songs and uh, stir your heart. I was up here getting choked up and uh, hope you don't mind that, getting choked up, you know. I remember one preacher talking about it and he was on the platform with another preacher and, and uh, he was starting to cry and the one preacher said, he's, he said, well, go. He's trying to hold back the tears. He said, go ahead. He said, enjoy yourself, you know. Let him go. And uh, that's the way it ought to be. It ought to be that way, no doubt about that. Three passages I want you to turn to. One story, three passages. Matthew chapter 8, Matthew chapter 8, Mark chapter 4, and Luke chapter 8. Now I know you're turning, so I'll give you some time to get there. Matthew chapter 8, Mark chapter 4, and Luke chapter 8. The deal with this subject of faith. Uh, last week, we looked at the testimony of the centurion. And you remember, 
we dealt with the fact that Jesus marveled. Jesus was amazed at his faith. Not a, not a Jew, uh, a Gentile, possibly not even an Italian, something maybe a Samaritan, don't really know, uh, but everything was against him, if you remember, as far as the Jews were concerned, but they felt him worthy. He was worthy for them. He loved the nation. He built them a synagogue. But you remember what he said about himself. He said, I, I'm not even worthy that Jesus should enter into my house. I'm, I would be an annoyance to His holiness. He had the right view of Himself and humility, and He showed generosity and a genuine love for the people of God, which was contrasted to those Jewish leaders who were the opposite. They were selfish, and they were self-righteous, and they thought that it was owed to them. And we looked at that matter. We saw His faith, the faith that made Jesus marvel, that that marveled the Master. What a testimony. Uh, to have that same humble, generous, loving faith that that centurion exhibited. Now, we come to uh, a setting of the story here that's a little bit different this morning. In Matthew chapter 8, Mark 4, Luke 8, same story uh, told from these different gospel writers. And uh, it's interesting as we examine... Uh, these passages of Scripture, what is going on in the life of the Lord Jesus and the life of His disciples. And each one of these passages sheds a little more light on the situation. That's why we'll read them all. There are not many verses in them. Matthew chapter 8, and if you look at verse number 18, you find out that the Bible says in Matthew 8, 18, Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about Him, He gave commandment to depart unto the other side. If you look at the other gospel records, you find out this is that time when the multitudes were just crowding around Jesus that he couldn't even, he, 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 he was, it was pressed against him and he had to get out and get into a, a boat and teach them from the, the shoreline there, just out a little ways and stand in that boat and teach them. Great multitude. And uh, he's been teaching all day long. And that's a, a wearisome thing. And his humanity was tired, and he says, I need some rest, so we're going to go over to the other side. What side are they on now? Well, they're on the west side, the northwest side. They're up near that city of Capernaum where Jesus had met with this centurion there and healed the centurion servant, that young boy. They were in that city, the earthly headquarters of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now they're going to leave Capernaum. They're going to go over to the east side. They're going to go over to the country of the Gergesenes, uh, you remember uh, Gadara and the maniacs that were there and the one that the Lord Jesus uh, touched and uh, drew the legion out of. You remember that? That's where they're headed. It gives you a little setting of the story. They're going, they're going to go over to the other side. Well, let's pick it up, if you will, in verse uh, number 19. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds there have nests. <clears throat> Excuse me, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples, pupils there, learners, uh, not necessarily the twelve, said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead. Verse 23, And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there rose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he said to them, Why are you fearful? O oh, ye of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled. We went from the master marveling to now the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? I want you to notice an expression in the 26th verse. Jesus said, Why are ye so fearful? O ye of little faith. Great faith contrasted with little faith. Look in the Gospel of Mark, if you would. Mark in the 4th chapter. Mark chapter 4, verse number 35. Mark gives us a little bit more of the setting. 
the same day, when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. So it wasn't just one, there were several. And there arose a great storm of wind, that tempest, as Matthew talked about. And the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and said to him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even wind and the sea obey him? Interesting. Matthew said there, O ye of little faith, quoting Jesus, Mark said, how is it that you have, that Jesus said, how is it that you have no faith? Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8, verse number 22. The Bible says in Luke 8, 22, Now it came to pass on a certain day, that he went into a ship with his disciples and said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased. And there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and water, and they obey him. Three expressions. O ye of little faith, no faith, where is your faith? Where is your faith? Interesting, as we look at these gospel records, and we think about Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they are showing to us the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, the power that he carries over disease, the power that he carries over death, the power that he carries over Satan, that he carries over uh, the demons of Satan, and then the power that he carries even over the natural elements of the world. And, and he is saying really to us, those gospel writers, they're pointing to us, Matthew to the Jews, Mark to the Roman mindset, Luke to the, to the Greek mindset, John to all people, they're pointing to us to tell us that Jesus Christ is rightful heir of the earth. He is King of kings and Lord of lords that He is all-powerful. We use a word for that. We say that He is omnipotent. He is over all. I think about the Gospel writer of Matthew, and you look at Matthew chapter 8, and you look at Matthew chapter 9, where we've been the last uh, couple of weeks, and, and we find out that there are nine recorded miracles in those two chapters, Matthew chapter 8 and Matthew chapter 9. The first three uh, were uh, diseases that Jesus Christ dealt with. The next three showed his power over the natural elements, is what we're looking at here today. Uh, uh, and the supernatural world as he cast out uh, 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 that demon out of legion. And, and then his power over sin as well. All of those uh, uh, miracles marvelously picture Jesus Christ's omnipotence. And when Matthew records these miracles, he, he, he puts them in a certain format. He he records three miracles, and then he records a response. And when you look at Matthew chapter 8, and we read verse 18 through verse number 22, we see uh, uh, that there's a response to those first three set of miracles. And the first group, if you read Matthew chapter 8, uh, uh, verse 1 uh, through verse number 17, you're going to see that the people were just enthralled. They were excited about what the Lord Jesus Christ had done. And then Jesus began to speak to them, and notice what he said again there in verse number 19. He said there was a certain scribe, one who studied the law, came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He said, If you're going to follow me, then it's going to be full surrender. It's going to be full out. 
It's going to be whatever I say, you will follow and you will do. That means that there won't be the comforts of this life like you might enjoy now. The Bible says in verse number 21, And other of his disciples said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. He's not yet dead yet. I want to go and take care of things at home. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me and let the dead bury their dead. He said it's a, it, it, it's a surrender of everything. It's a following. It's an obedience. That's what it's all about. And then he goes on to give us this miracle that's recorded in verse 23 through verse number 27. Certain things are taking place. I want you to notice, first of all, the actions that are taking place. There are times when there are disciples. Now, we're not talking about the twelve. But there are times when there were disciples who were following. They were pupils. They were learners. They were curious about things. And they were following. But when Jesus began to speak of what it meant to truly be a believer... They departed. They went no more with Him. They, they didn't follow Him anymore. And we find that at this particular time in, in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ around the city of Capernaum, this great multitude that was pressing against the Lord Jesus Christ to hear Him, He decides, I'm going to, I'm going to leave this western shore of the Galilee. I'm going to travel across. I'm going to go across this lake. Uh, I, I need some rest. There's been, a, uh, uh, there's been a lot going on this day. He's been teaching... Uh, uh, from the morning until the evening, and you may say, well, that's, that that's, doesn't take a whole lot of effort just talking all the time. Uh, uh, you ought to try doing it for a while. He was worn out. I thought he was God. He is God, but he's man too. He was showing just as much humanity there. He's tired. He needed to rest. That was his desire. And the Bible tells us in the Gospel of Mark that not only was it there one ship there, there were many ships and they were going across to the other side. Jesus had already chosen out those twelve that we call the twelve disciples or the twelve apostles. No doubt they were probably on those boats there with him. Uh, but we think about the disciples in general, just a disciple. Disciples, a, it's a broad word as I've said. It means learner, it means a pupil. And the context of the word disciple determines how it is to be interpreted. It, 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 is, it can be interpreted here as a follower, one who's, who's just following. Uh, context always rules the day there. If you look in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 1, uh, as we open here the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, the Bible says in verse number 1 in Matthew chapter 5, seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was said, his disciples came unto him, the followers, the followers, uh, people were interested in what Jesus had to say. And at that point, their, their level of commitment, it's, it's undetermined. You don't really know. In uh, verse 21 of the passage we just read, in Matthew chapter 8, the Bible says, another of his disciples said to him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And in other words, he was a learner, not a committed believer. There was some curiosity was there. Maybe he had received something at an intellectual point, but... He wasn't a committed believer yet. Look in John chapter 15 with me for just a moment. John chapter 15 and verse number 6. John 15, verse number 6. Uh, this passage we know is the passage of abiding in the vine. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. And verse number 6, notice what the Bible says, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Followers, but not believers. Listening, learning, a pupil, but not true believers. So there were people, disciples, who were attracted to Jesus. They, they followed Him. They were, they were students of His. They were listening. And there's different categories we can put them in. There's those who we could say were the inquisitive group. Or if you want to use another term, you could say curious. They were curious about what was going on. They, in other words, they followed Jesus out of fascination. I mean, everywhere He went, He was doing some type of miracle. And so they were just amazed at that. And they were following Jesus. They were curious about what was going on. They were inquisitive about what He was saying there. But they weren't willing to make a full commitment to Jesus Christ. You say, how do you know there were those like that? Well, look with me, if you would, in John chapter 6 for just a minute. John chapter 6, and look at verse number 66. 
The Bible says in John 6, 66, from that time, many of His disciples went back and walked with Him no more. Now, let me tell you something. That's not believers they're talking about. there. That's not believers. That's those who were inquisitive. They were curious, but they weren't committed. Then there's those who are indebted, indebted, Notice verse 67, you're there in John chapter 6, look at verse 67. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, He looked around, there were many others that were there, but He looked around, He looked at the twelve. And what does He say? Will you also go away? Are you going to leave as well? What did they answer in verse 68? Well, Peter speaks up, he answered and said, Lord, by the way, I think every true believer, we'd have to echo the words of Peter. Lord, To whom shall we go, Lord? There's no other place to go. He says there in verse 68, Thou hast the words of eternal life. In verse 69, and notice here, it went from being just a a student, just a learner, to a believer. And we believe and are sure that Thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. What's he saying? We're not the kind of disciples that are just curious, Jesus. We're indebted. We're committed. Thou hast the words of life. And so you have the inquisitive, you have the indebted, but then you have the intellectuals. And where do you see the intellectuals? Well, look in John chapter 3 with me for just a minute. There was a Pharisee there, a man by the name of Nicodemus. And really, he kind of falls into the last two categories that we're talking about. He was an intellectual, and the last category of disciples, sometimes they're the invisible. They're the undercover disciples. They're the ones that wear the Jesus first pin on the inside of the lapel and sit on the outside of the lapel. You know, I'm an undercover Christian. That type of thing. Well, that's the disciples that he was talking about, the intellectuals. And, by the way, you know before Nicodemus ever came to know Jesus, he was convinced of who he was. So how do you know that? Well, look in John chapter 3. The Bible says there, verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. Said to him, Rabbi, teacher, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. We know that you're come from God. You're different than all the others. He understood something of who he was. He had an intellectual assent to him. And you think about the invisible disciples. They kept their belief a secret. These are the disciples who would flee the first time things got tough and the first time there was some bump in the road. They would flee. They would go and scatter in different directions. Now all these categories, the inquisitive, the indebted, the intellectuals, the invisible, they were all following Jesus, but He was about to do something there on that sea that was beyond belief. Something that was amazing. Something that was going to make them marvel. I want you to think about what took place here. Look back in Matthew chapter 8, verse number 24. Matthew chapter 8, verse number 24. They had entered into this ship, and there were other ships with them, as Mark said. His disciples followed him. He couldn't get away. He was trying to rest. He couldn't get away from the crowd. They came with him. Verse number 24, And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Here it is, a crisis. Traveling in relatively open vessels, these ships that they were on, without much protection at all. They're going across this Sea of Galilee. If you know anything about the Sea of Galilee, it's really a lake. It's a lake that's several hundred feet below sea level. Its water empties into the Jordan River, and the Jordan River empties into the Dead Sea, which is over a thousand feet below sea level. If you study something about the Sea of Galilee, you find out that storms, even to this day, will come upon that lake very quickly. The warm air that comes across the desert will go down across the Golan Heights and come down into the rocks and the ravines of the Sea of Galilee. I've never been there. I'd love to go there and see it. If I don't get to in this life, I'll get to see the new one, though. That'll be a great thing. But it goes across, down across those Golan Heights, and 
and uh, storms can come up in a, in in very quick uh, 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 a matter of time, or hardly any time at all for a storm to come up, and a major storm, rough storm. Uh, warm air could do that, but cold air could cause the worst types of storms, and so no doubt that's what was taking place. It would come out uh, from the west and across the Mount Hermon in the north, and it would collide with the warm air that was there over that sea, and those strong winds would forcefully be drawn down in those ravines and valleys that border that lake, and that storm came up. The Bible uses the term a great tempest. That word tempest means quaking or shaking. Actually, literally, a water quaking. You and I would probably call today something like a hurricane or a tornado, and a tornado of water is called a water spout. It came out across that lake. And when we find that Matthew uses this expression, behold, in other words, uh, it came suddenly out of the blue, behold. It was an amazing thing. A great tempest in the sea. Now those fishermen, they knew Simon Peter, Andrew, John, they were fishermen. They knew that lake. They probably felt like they knew it, like we would use the expression, like the back of their hand. And they probably had seen many storms come up on that lake, but the Bible makes a point to say this was a great, in other words, a major, a mega storm. They probably hadn't seen one like this at all in their entire lives as it came up. Now notice what the Bible says in verse number 24. There arose a great tempest in the sea, and so much that the ship was covered, so the Water is coming up. They're taking on water. But I want you to notice the end of verse number 24. But he was asleep. Can you imagine? Now, I don't know about you. I lived around water for two and a half years. Water on all sides of me. A sound on one side and the Atlantic Ocean on the other side. I'm not a big fanatic of water. Maybe you are, but I'm not. We were down in the Outer Banks, uh, well, a couple months ago now, and my wife said, I'd, I'd, like, to, I'd like to ride one of those uh, wave runner things. And I thought, hallelujah. <laughs> we did. I was praying the whole time, praise the Lord. <laughs> Don't let me gum off of this thing. Now, if you know anything about sounds, you know that most of the time, the sound is not as rough and not as raging as the ocean. In a storm it can be. As a matter of fact, in hurricanes, the water actually gets sucked out of the sounds. It'll be just a bare uh, a sandbar right out through there. But a sound, for the most part, except where the channel is, where, where ships go to and fro, a sound is, is only about four or five feet deep, the water. In other words... You can touch the bottom. You just stand up. But that day happened to be probably the windiest day the whole day we were there. And the water was choppy, to say the least. Now I remember we went out there and the man, he said, now I want you to know something. He said, in all likelihood, you're not going to be able to touch the bottom. I kind of looked at her like, wonderful. That's great. I don't swim. I sink. We got out there, and praise the Lord, I think maybe I, maybe I understood maybe a fraction of what these disciples understood, because as we were going out through there, and I was driving the thing, you know, I'm the man, I'll drive the thing. You know, let me get that thing. and I'd take off and go in towards the waves, and that water is just coming back, and I mean, you can't see a thing. It was, you know, just splashing me in the face all the way out through there. Maybe I understand a little bit about what these guys were experiencing. But when all that's going on and this great storm is raging uh, 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 about them and uh, uh, they're taking on water, they're sinking, we find that Jesus is what? He's asleep. He's sleeping. Now, as I mentioned a little while ago, that, that, that reveals to me a couple of things. First of all, I understand that speaks to how tired Jesus was, His humanness. He needed some rest. And so he's laying there asleep. But it also speaks to me about something else. There was no worry to the Son of God what was going on outside. 
He had no worry whatsoever about all the winds and the waves and the storms and the water that was going down while the disciples were outside, those that were on that ship, while they were panicking, Jesus was at perfect peace with His heavenly Father. He knew everything is all right. Everything is going to be just fine right there. What confidence He had in the Father's care. Now I want you to know something. If you have Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, do you know something? That you can have that same confidence no matter what storm is beating in your life. You know why? Because you're in His care. You're in the Lord Jesus Christ's protection in His care, in His hand, and He is in the Father's hand, and nothing can come to you that He won't allow, and the Lord Jesus is there restfully, peacefully sleeping. Hey, I want you to know something. The Lord Jesus said this. He said, we are going to the other side, and He already knew before they ever stepped onto that boat that night, He already knew what was going to take place. He knew the storm, and He was taking, listen now, He was taking His disciples, those that were with Him, He was taking them through the storm. Do you know something? Sometimes Jesus leads you into a storm. But if He's with you, you have nothing to fear. You have nothing to fear and quake and tremble about. Listen, we get tossed around by circumstances. We, we begin to doubt God and believe if, if, if He's with us. We begin to panic. But Jesus Christ was perfectly calm in the storm. I want you to know something. He was teaching those disciples a lesson they needed to learn and you and I need to learn as well. That whatever the storms may come, and you've heard the expression many times, I probably don't even have to repeat it, you're either in a storm, have come out of a storm, or getting ready to go back into one, right? One of those types of things is happening in your life. I want you to think about something. Those sailors, those men, they knew something about that sea and they understood how to navigate their way through storms. But in this particular storm, they were doing everything possible to keep those boats afloat and they were realizing something. This is absolutely futile. We're going down. We're going to sink. And finally, when they should have done this to begin with, that the first time... Finally, they came to Jesus when everything seemed lost. And now, think about this from a human standpoint. These fishermen coming to a former carpenter to ask about how to navigate a storm. Think about that from a human standpoint. Notice their alarm in verse number 25. His disciples came to Him and woke Him, saying, Lord, save us! We perish! We're going to die here! And notice His response. He saith unto them, why are you fearful? Oh, ye of little faith. Uh, Mark records for us that in verse number 38, just a blunt response, uh, uh, the disciples, they came in, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Listen, don't you understand something? We're drowning out here. You've got to wake up. They were just amazed at such indifference there. But I want you to know something, that Jesus had brought them exactly where He wanted them. He brought them exactly where He wanted them. You know, sometimes the Lord has to bring us into a desperate situation to get our attention. To get us to awaken and to be alert to Him. Look, they were out of human resources. Do you know where Jesus Christ wants to bring you and I to? To a place where we're at the end of ourselves. No more human help will do. Now they had to have, look, they had to have God intervene. There had to be a divine solution here. They had fear, and they had fear mixed with faith. If they had exhibited absolute confidence in Jesus Christ, they would have been like Him, confident in the storm. He was confident in His Father's care. Many of us, we cry to God in our desperation, and that's okay, because He allows desperation to come to bring us to Himself, whether it's sickness, whether it's disease, whether it's death, whether it's the loss of a job, the loss of a loved one, family problems. Hey, salvation in and of itself is a response in the desperation of a sinner. Lord, as Peter cried, Lord, save me. But often our first cry is like these of those disciples. Jesus, don't you care? We're dying out here. Don't you care? Now you say, I've never said that, preacher. If you've ever thought it, you've demonstrated a lack of faith in God as I have before. I want you to look with me, if you would, just a couple places. Look in the Psalms for just a minute. Others, other saints have suffered the similar thing. 
They get comforted about by the trials and the concerns and the cares of this life. Look in Psalm 10 with me for just a minute, if you would. Psalm 10. David cried out in Psalm 10, verse number 1. Why? Psalm 10, 1. Why standest thou far off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? He went on to talk about the wicked and what had taken what is taking place. He said, Why are you so far off, Lord? Why are you so far away? Have you ever felt that way? Look in Psalm 44. Psalm 44, verse number 22. Psalm 44, 22. Yea, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Awake! Why sleepest thou, O Lord? Arise, cast us not off forever. Have you ever thought about that in your family, and your situation? Have you ever thought about that about your finances? Have you ever thought about that about some situation in your life? Why are you so far off? I'm dying here. Why aren't you listening? Don't you care? Look in Isaiah 51. Isaiah 51, verse number 9. Isaiah 51, 9, Awake! Awake! Put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake! As in the ancient days, in the generations of old, art thou not it that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? The prophet saying, Lord, why don't you get up? Don't you see the terrible problem that your country is in? Your people? Lord, how can you possibly sleep through these? And you and I, look, if we'll be honest, Trials and problems come in our life and we respond the same way. Now, we may not verbally say it out loud, but we say it in our heart. Lord, why have you left me? Why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? I want you to know something. We should consider the, re- the re- reply that Jesus gave these disciples in the boat in Matthew chapter 8. He said there in that reply in verse number 26, Why? Why? Are ye fearful? Oh, ye of little faith. Now when you think about that question, you know, can you think about the disciples? Jesus looks up at them. I mean, the boat's bobbing up and down like a cork. You know, the ocean. Maybe water's coming down even where Jesus is, coming into the boat. And they wake up, Jesus, and He looks at them and says, what are you guys scared of? What are you trembling about? Oh, ye of little faith? And they're, maybe they're standing in water saying, I, can't you look around and see? Don't you understand what's going on? We're going to die here. We're going to sink in this thing. And you and I, we get into a problem and a trial in life. And what do we say? Lord, here I am. I'm dying. I'm sinking. Where are you in all of this? Jesus looks at them and says, why are you so fearful? Why are you so cowardly? By the way, it's the same word in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8 that characterizes those who will stand at the great white throne judgment. The Bible says, you know what the first thing is? And the fearful. The fearful. Even before, listen, even before he says, and the unbelieving, he says the fearful. The cowardly. The cowardly. Mark records Jesus saying, how is it that you have no faith? Luke records Jesus asking the question, Where is your faith? Where is it? We get guilty of doubting God's love, God's power, but if we believe in those two attributes of His love and His power, we can weather any storm that comes in life because we understand that our Heavenly Father handles any situation. He's in control of whatever the situation may be. The disciples, what were they doing there? They were questioning Jesus' care. They were questioning uh, Jesus' ability. I I think their response probably surprised Jesus because think of what they'd seen. Think of what they had evidenced. Look back just for a moment in Matthew chapter 4. Think of what they had seen just in this this time period leading up to this particular situation. Matthew chapter 4, verse number 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee. What was He doing? Teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And what did they see? Healing all manner of sickness. 
and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought in him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. He had healed all these people. He had shown uh, a supernatural, omnipotent power over any disease and over any sickness uh, that was brought to him, even raising the dead uh, back to life. They had seen all that. And can you imagine as they stood there with water coming in and Jesus standing there looking at them, He says, why are you so afraid? Why are you so cowardly? Why are you so fearful? Don't you realize who I am? Don't you understand what I can do? Don't you realize that I can step on uh, uh, to the top of this boat and say, peace, be still, and everything quieted? Oh, yes, I know the skeptics would say, well, sure, uh, uh, the wind can come and go. Oh, the wind can come and go, but I lived around the water long enough to know that even when the wind comes and goes, the waves still roll. But the Bible says there, they gave testimony that even the wind and the waves obeyed Him. When He said, peace be still, I want you to know something, friends. Everything went calm. I believe that sea went back to being as calm as it was before that storm ever came. It's amazing. You and I can see a demonstration like these disciples saw in what was going on in Matthew 4, 23 and 24. We can see God move in a great and miraculous way and, and, and then certain circumstances come in our life and we forget everything that God has provided for us. We forget everything that God has done by His supernatural power. The disciples soon learn something. If you read Luke 17, 5, you find out that they ask Jesus this. They said, increase our faith. Increase our faith. By the way, not long after they asked the Lord Jesus to increase their faith, you know what He did? He healed ten lepers. They had to say after that, have faith in God. God can do whatever. Faith needs constant strengthening. My faith needs it. Your faith needs it. If we know that He loves us, if we know that He cares about us, if we know that He is able to help us, let me ask you a question. As He asked these disciples that day, what do I and what do you have to fear? Why are we so fearful? Why are we so fearful? Why is it that we have little faith, no faith? Where is our faith? Where is our faith? Even if the disciples, look, even if they would have drowned, they could have rest assured if their faith and confidence was in Christ, that they would be with Him. Now, I want you to look with me for just a moment because I believe they understood something that we need to understand. The testimony that has come before. Look in Psalm, if you would, Psalm 89. Psalm 89. They shouldn't have been afraid. Why not? Well, they had the Psalms. They understood what God had said in His Word. What does God say in the Psalms? Well, certainly they would have thought of Psalm 89 and verse number 9. Psalm 89, verse number 9. Thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. What does David say there? He says, look, God is in control. He rules the raging of the sea. When the waves arise, He quiets them. He stills them. Look back in Psalm 46 with me for just a moment. Psalm 46. Psalm 46, verse number 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be cast in the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Selah. Think on these things. God controls the bounds of the ocean. God controls the sea. Surely someone would have thought of Psalm 107. Look at Psalm 107. Psalm 107. Verse 23. Psalm 107, verse 23. They that go down to the sea in ships, 
that do business in great waters. These see the works of the Lord and His wonders in the deep. Have you ever stood there and watched the ocean? Have you ever seen how it can come so far and it doesn't come any further? And have you ever looked? I remember as a child, I remember just looking and even as an adult now and standing and looking out over that. I've only seen the Atlantic Ocean and watched and just as far as you could see, just as far as I could carry, water. And I think about the limitless power, the limitless ability of our God. Those that do business in ships, those that go down to the sea, they understand that. They see that. Notice what the Bible says. Verse 25, For He commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Does that sound like these disciples? Boy, they were going back and forth, reeling to and fro. They come to Jesus. They're at their wit's end. They said, Master, Lord, Teacher, we're going to die. We're going to drown here. They're at their wit's end. Verse 28, Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and He bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves are ever still. Then, well that's an important word, then are they glad because they be quiet. So He bringeth them unto their desired haven. Boy, that's, a, that's an implicit, prophetic thought of what Jesus Christ did here in Matthew chapter 8. I mean, the conclusion you have to come to is absolutely unarguable that Jesus is exactly who He said He is, that He is God, creator of heaven and earth, ruler of the universe. If the disciples would have grasped that, would they have understood that? They had no reason to fear. They had no reason to fear. But you don't understand, preacher, my problem in my situation is greater. I want you to know something. God is greater than your situation. God is greater than your problem. God's greater than any problem I have or any problem that I will face. Notice his authority, if you would, back in Matthew chapter 8, verse number 26. The Bible says, Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea. There was a great calm. One preacher said, a lot of people call this the story of the storm, but he said something I like. He said, I call it the story of the calm. The story of the calm. Jesus brought the calm. A man by the name of William Cowper, he wrote in him, the title of the hymn is God Moves in a Mysterious Way. God moves in a mysterious way as wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Mark chapter 4, verse number 39. We find what Jesus said to this storm. In Mark 4, 39, He arose, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, simply this, Peace, be still. And instantly, there was a great calm. It's as though Jesus stood there and He said, Shh, quiet. And just that quickly, everything stilled. It's hard for us to try to recount that. <laughs> it's hard for me to try to stand up here and, and be as dramatic as I can possibly be and tell you everything was swirling around and Jesus stepped out on the bow of that ship and said, Shh, be still. But I guarantee you, if you and I would have been there to see it happen. If we would have been present and watched it, no doubt we would have responded just like these disciples responded. You know how they responded? The Bible says they were, they were, Jesus said they were fearful, but the Bible says they marveled. They were of great exceeding fear at the end of this. You say, well, why were they exceedingly afraid? Why were they so upset there? Because they realized who Jesus Christ is. They realized exactly who He is. Let me tell you something, that is power. It's been said that if uh, the United States of America and the former 
Soviet Union could stockpile all of their nuclear weapons and detonate them at one time, it would not be the same amount of power that the life of a hurricane, the energy that it produces in its lifetime. You think about that, that's pretty powerful. Pretty powerful. I don't know how strong this storm was. I don't know where it would be categorized in the scale of man today, but I know it was a strong storm. And right in the midst of that storm, Jesus simply walks out and says, Shh, be still. And it stops. Let me tell you something. What's Matthew saying to us? What's Mark saying to us? What's Luke saying to us as they write those gospel records? They're saying, the one who conquers disease, the one who conquers uh, 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 death, all of those things, the one who conquers nature, he is God of gods and Lord of lords. I want you to see what happened in verse number 27. Matthew chapter 8, verse number 27. The Bible says, But the men marveled. The men marveled. In Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8, in verse 25, the Bible says, They, being afraid, wondered. They were fearful. Matter of fact, Mark 4.41 says they feared exceedingly, greatly. What experience, What an experience. What an amazing experience. Now, you might have been afraid of the storm, but it was a more fearful thing to recognize that the God who created the storm was in the boat with you. By the way, these disciples weren't the first to experience this. You could read about Job in Job 42 and how he was terrified of the presence of the Lord. Isaiah, woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. He saw the Lord high and lifted up there. Chapter 6, verse 5. What about Daniel? Daniel chapter 10. You read verse 7, 8, and 9. You find out that when the Lord Jesus appeared before Daniel, what did He do? Let me tell you something, friends. He didn't do what some of these places do and give a hand clap for Jesus. You know what He did? He hit His face. He fell on His face. What about Peter? Luke chapter 5, what did he say? He said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. I recognize who I am. Paul, what did he do? He was blinded on the road to Damascus. In Acts chapter 9, he said, I know who you are, you're Jesus. And he said, what, what do you desire for me to do? What is it that you want me to do? I give my life to you. In Acts chapter 9. I think about that. And I think about myself standing before a holy God, standing in His presence. Look, I'd be more than overwhelmed, dear friends. If the blessed Son of God were to enter this room today, I believe every last one of us would do as those soldiers did that night in the garden. We'd hit the ground in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and His holiness. They knew what it was for God to be with them. And that terrified them. They were exceedingly afraid. Why? Because he was the omniscient one. He could read their thoughts. He knew everything they were thinking. I want you to look at one last thing. Look at verse number 28. Just the first part of it. You remember what Jesus had said at the beginning? He said, we're going to the other side. In verse number 28, the Bible says, and when he was come, to the other side. Now I don't know about you, but that's encouraging. Jesus said, we're going over. Storm? Oh yeah, it's coming. But I want you to know something. We're going over. We're going to the other side. Do you know something? The Lord has promised you and I that we're going to the other side if you're one of His children. It doesn't matter how dark the skies get. It doesn't matter how strong the winds and the waves roll. We are going to make it to the other side. The boat wouldn't sink because Jesus was on board the boat. The storm, listen, the storm was not going to last forever and my storm and your storm is not going to last forever. I'm not going to go under because Jesus Christ is with me. There's absolute safety with Jesus Christ in a storm than in a calm without Him. You can mark that down. Listen to this. Safety is not the absence of a storm. It's the presence of the Savior. 
It's not the absence of the storm. We all, we're like, we're like Moses. Uh, God, why don't you just take Pharaoh out of the way? Why don't you just kill Pharaoh? God says, no, I'm going with you through Pharaoh. And we want all the storms of life out of our way, but Jesus says, no, I want to teach you a great lesson going through the storm. See, faith doesn't necessarily mean that every time a storm comes, we call upon the Lord and He'll immediately calm the storm down. Sometimes Jesus will say, as He said to the waves that day and the wind, He'll say, peace be still, and He'll calm the storm. But then there's sometimes when He'll say, peace be still to the saint, while the storm rages all about. Sometimes Jesus will change the situation for the saint. Other times Jesus will change the saint in the situation. The songwriter wrote these words that's very appropriate. We sing the mighty power of God who bade the mountains rise, who spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. We sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines too at His command and all the stars obey. Lord, how Thy wonders are displayed where'er we turn our eyes, whene'er we view the ground we tread or gaze upon the skies. There's not a plant nor flower below but makes thy glories known. And clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne. On thee each moment we depend. If thou withdraw, we die. Oh, may we ne'er that God offend who is forever nigh. Let me tell you something. If you have Jesus, He'll see you through the storm to the other side. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We're going to pray together in just a moment. I ask you the question that Jesus asked. Why are ye so fearful? Why are ye so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Where is your faith? Let me ask you this question. What kind of a disciple are you? What kind of disciple are you? Are you an inquisitive disciple? Are you curious? Are you indebted? I'm committed. I'm committed. I'm a believer. You're like Peter. You've come to the place to say, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life. And I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Do you give some intellectual assent to Jesus? Do you recognize who He is? Are you invisible? Are you an invisible disciple today? Which category do you fall in? By the way, if if you're an indebted, if you're a committed disciple, then let me tell you what will be evidence in your life. Obedience. Obedience will be evidence. If you're not, why don't you make the necessary changes? What about trials? Are you faced with the trial? What is God trying to teach you in the trial, in the problem? Is He he trying to get your attention? Is He speaking to you so that you can depend more upon Him? The Bible says there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you might be able to bear it. Meditate on that truth. I wonder, have you ever had a crisis where you know you didn't fully trust the Lord, you didn't fully place your confidence in Him, and He was able to help you? Why don't you go back there again and read? I'm not going to read it back to you again. You go back there and read Psalm 107. You read verse 23 through verse 30. The Bible says, Then as they placed confidence in Him. Then He brought them to their desired haven and they found rest. Jesus, I believe, still says to His children today, Come unto Me, all you that are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Whatever the trial, whatever the problem is, will you, will you trust Him? Will you faith Him? Will you bring it to Him? Those sailors, they knew they knew that sea. It wasn't a point of whether that ship was sturdy enough to carry them across. It was a point of who was on the ship. 
Listen, Jesus will carry to the other side as a believer. Trust Him. Let's stand together. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Lord Jesus, as you spoke of the hearts of people, may they